So we're um, very glad to be back again for some more chats about songwriting and uh, collaboration. Tonight it is our songwriting collaboration seminar and we've got an incredible panel lined up. Um, so much information, so much experience, knowledge, expertise in the world of publishing, of songwriting, of recording, uh, making money, crediting and everything else in between. We'll meet them and we'll ask them a little bit about what they do to kick us off. But first of all, would you please give a very warm welcome to the room to Nicholas Molander, Charlie Arm and indeed our own Niall Breslin Brezzy. Come on out, lads. Whichever way you like, Charlie, that's spot on. So, um, we were saying we're going to have a... I did say we're going to lead off with a chat about what you guys do, but um, in a change to build proceedings, we're going to get kick off with Brexit. So, um, Charlie, you're here to um, talk on behalf of the UK. What the fuck? Okay, okay that's fine. Um, no, no comment. <laughs> no comment, fair enough. Can you draw where our border is? <laughs> yeah, can you draw the border, as he said, which is uh, interesting. Uh, okay, so let's kick off. Um, Charlie, do you want to tell us about Tollyard? Oh, yeah. Um, so, uh, five years ago, um, myself and my business partners, were, uh, we were all in different areas of the music industry. Two were songwriters. I was a, a failing A&R person. And um, and our other partner was a property developer. And the property developer said to songwriters, um, hey, I've got this great space um, up in King's Cross. Um, it's 100,000 square feet. I don't really know what to do with it. Could you come and have a look at it? They went up and saw the space and, um, and said, well, this is great. We can, we can make studios up here. King's Cross is, I don't know how many people here know what King's Cross used to be like in London. It used to be the absolute worst area of London. Go forward five years, we have 85 studios, uh, publishing company, management company and record label um, in that 100,000 square feet. It was against the odds. People said it would never work. We would never be successful starting off uh, with a new company. We definitely wouldn't be successful doing it in King's Cross of all places. And now uh, we've found ourselves in the middle of the music industry, which is all moving into the area. So Tallyard is a studio complex, management company, publishing company, and record label. And we're quite well-rounded on everything in, in the industry. We try to be. So from a point of view of collaboration, how would you describe your role now as a kind of this overseer of lots of different elements of music industry? H how would you kind of describe your, the way you would either influence collaboration or are involved in collaboration in the music industry? I'm, I'm a matchmaker. That's my job. I learned that really early on, um, that my job i'm not the talent in the room i'm not that i'm i definitely can't play an instrument and uh i wouldn't really always trust my ears either you know i get it right 50 percent of the time i probably get it wrong 50 percent of the time but that's i take good, that. that's good hit rate in uh, fairness like i'd like that one at least i'm honest um <laughs> and um but my my job is to try and pair people together that's my job as you know when i pick up an artist and we go look we've got to run uh, the first couple of years with you, we need to pair you up with uh, the right songwriters, with the right producers, and you need to use our studio complex to do that. Um, we, we open the doors up and we say, just go for it. You know, we, we, we'll find the right songwriters, we'll put you in the right place. And that's one part of my job. My other part of my job is to find the right songwriters to put into the place. And I have this theory that 50% of it is their talent, but 50% of it is down to the person that they are. If I put the right person into the right place, they will network, they will make things happen themselves as well as me matchmaking. And that means that double the things will happen. Um, so I'm, f I'm all about finding the right people, the right talent, and then putting people together. Cool. Uh, we kind of saw that with we, Carly um, Marie in last week talking to us about um, working in Xenomania. And the amount of people that went through there that that didn't make the that didn't make the grade, and the amount of people then it is down to like not just 
talent application is huge and then attitude I suppose is a key element to that as well let's return to finding those songwriters and making those matches but Nicholas um, it says here and it, it said on your website so it must be true Audley is redefining creator, meta, uh, creator metadata collection by providing a unique data identifier that establishes a transparent and digitized information flow now obviously I know what that means but if I was to boring <laughs> <laughs> can you tell us about what Audley does can I first say that I'm actually a songwriter? Can we say of that? Of course, first? yes. <laughs> uh, I'm a songwriter and producer, and I've been doing that for more than 20 years. Mm. And uh, I found three up-and-coming songwriters and that I really wanted to support. And the best way of doing that is to start a publishing company so you get their publishing, then you can help them. Up until then, I had no idea how important data is. And all the data, we hit the word data, we hear data all the time, so we need to later tonight get down to what is the data that we're talking about but data is so important and we need to find ways of capturing the data early from the only ones that knows the truth about the data the creators in the studio no one else can tell what was going on in the studio so i needed a tool for that as a publisher for my up-and-coming writers that i was working with didn't find anyone uh, any any system for for my creators so i created one instead so that is the background and what you just said is what we do, but let's we can talk in another language so we really <laughs> understand what it is. Is that on the website actually? Yeah, I, oh, that's okay. a cut and paste. Oh, we need to change that. <laughs> no. no, so that's what I'm doing right now, and uh, it's um, it's a bit depressing actually to talk about this part of the music industry, but so important. Absolutely, because we want music creation to be a sustainable income source and a an, an sustainable profession, and then. We need to talk about the data. We can never get away from it, especially not in the new way of music consumption when everything is so fast, everything is digital. It's even more important than it was, was before. Um, excellent. Okay, um, Brezzy, by way of introduction, obviously, um, we probably, most of them will know you better than the two boys. We've chatted before. Um, musician, producer, studio owner, tell us about Camden Recording Studios because obviously I saw, I was on Facebook yesterday, you guys are calibrating the room and so we're obviously at a very advanced age and it's been up and running for ages as well. Yeah, well, we, I lived in London um, for four or five years. Uh, I went over there when the Blizzards kind of decided to take a very long break and I, I got signed, to, I was with Universal Publishing at the time as a songwriter and I was signed to 19 and I didn't like London, to be per perfectly honest. I was very uncomfortable in the city. Uh, I was very uncomfortable with the energy that was there and I, I felt that I... I wasn't being, I suppose, wasn't doing very well as what I wanted to do, and I also felt it was quite clicky, uh, which is not, which is natural, you know. You you, you realize you're you're going over there, and and I found it difficult. And my whole dream was that I wanted to buy a studio. I wanted to take over a studio. I wanted to develop a studio. And actually, I I went to Tyler a couple of years ago, and I I remember seeing it going. This is like this is, this is beyond what I've ever seen it's so the, the it was it's just incredibly brave to do something like that when an industry is on its knees mm -hmm. we have to be honest here um the music industry it's kind of coming out of it but Jesus Christ five years ago it was in a bad pl place and to do something like that was if you don't want me saying absolutely crazy um but when I came back to Dublin it was Dublin was obviously was the height of the recession and I, I kind of felt maybe there's a chance I could buy a studio. That was kind of what I wanted to do. And I was renting a studio. I was renting upstairs in Camden Street, Camden Studios and the person downstairs, I never even met them. And I, I just said, this is a beautiful property that's not been, not been used. It's, it's, an, it's an absolute shit. There was moss growing on the, the walls. It was, it was desperate. And studios were closing in Dublin all the time. And we decided to buy it and take a chance and buy the property and develop it and you know develop it properly but what we didn't want to do in dublin what dublin doesn't need is another recording studio it needs a production hub it needs a place where people can come in and look like what we've always been brilliant at is so as songwriters but we've never had those we've never had a lot of pop producers really you know high-end pop production like the like the swedish model which is just which took over the world so that's kind of what our aim was with the studio how do we grow this into something that becomes a pub for writers, for 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 creative people, and and the other idea behind it was like having lived in London, you always hear that the artists that get signed to Universal, to Sony, they're always like, let's send them to LA for a couple of weeks, let's send them to New York, let's send them here, and then I said to my partners, why can't it be Dublin? 
why can't they send them here? Why can't we create something here that people can send? People love this city. It's, you know, when do people do come here, they tend not to do a lot of work, unfortunately. Um, especially where Camden Street is, it's between Camden Street and Hardcore Street, where our studio is. So when the bands discover that, they tend to not do a lot of recording. But I do think Dublin can become that, and it has to become that, because we cannot let an awful lot of these big acts that are doing very well in Ireland, they weren't signed here. They weren't caught here. We lost them. They went, they went overseas, and they absolutely rightly so. Uh, but we need to start building the industry here because we keep losing these big artists, and they keep going over and being signed to UK art labels, and they're bolstering that industry, but they're not bolstering this industry, and we really have to look. And we al also have to separate the industry. The live industry is thriving. We have an amazing live industry in this country. People love going to gigs, but there's, there's many sides to the music industry, and for me, the most important side is the recording process, and it's the production process. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a live industry. No, and I remember the last time we spoke, you were talking about creating that production hub and obviously like you know you've been busy and you've been making that making it so mm -hmm. um and the idea as you were saying at that time was bring people to ireland to dublin to be to be in a, a creative inspirational place and a fun place as well because obviously all work and no play makes a jack a dull boy and yeah. bands yeah if studio's not good fun then it's it's like i, I i'm obsessed with it I, I love it but i think everyone that comes in there should not, not every band and not every writer likes me in a studio. They go, I prefer playing live. But if you, I, I used to find it really difficult going into a, a writing session. And you, you know within five minutes, you go, this is a waste of time. There's no energy here at all. Just clicking. And, and I remember you'd gone in some sessions and you'd be writing for maybe an artist. And they'd come in and they'd be on their phone. I'm like, do you give that little shit about your career that you're going to sit here in a writing session looking at Twitter? I'm like, it, you know, that's the issue because they're kind of going... What's happened quite a lot with the writing industry is people are writing for markets rather than writing for themselves. They're going, how do I, how do I appeal to those markets? Mm. They buy lots of records, they go to gigs. Mm. How do I write songs for them? And it becomes an algorithm. Mm -hmm. And that's when music becomes diluted and it becomes sterile and it doesn't become people. And I think that's the one thing we try to create in the studio is that if that's what you want to do, you're in the wrong place. You, you, need, to, you need to expose yourself uh, Figuratively, you don't have to expose yourself. Any of the, say you can do that if you want, but uh, you probably get arrested. Um, but the idea you have to let yourself go. You have to you have to expose some of yourself emotionally to write music. Otherwise, you're just you're not going to fool anyone. So just so we kind of know and have a sense of what everybody's here for, um, like just hands up roughly how many people in the room would be songwriters, musicians. Okay, and hands up people that would be producers and okay. So it's about, and hands up everybody else that's <laughs> general public. You're, okay. <laughs> that one man's like, shit, why did I put my hand up? <laughs> um, okay, so mostly songwriters. Okay, so I think that's interesting, and I just opened it to the floor here. How do you create, you know, um, you guys have already spoken about matchmaking, Charlie, and creating a, a positive vibe, and getting the room right, and walking into that room, Brezzy, and it maybe not feeling right. So how do you create a positive environment and get the right people into the room that will result in a positive uh, collaboration? Trial and error. Okay. There's really, there's, there really is no, uh, you, you can, and I say this to, to my artists all the time, you, you can go on paper, oh my God, this is the greatest collection I'm expecting the most of this writing session and that be the one that delivers absolutely nothing because it could be that the, the weather wasn't good outside or someone's dog died in the morning or someone didn't even turn up to the session. There's so many different variables in the creative process. You're all creatives in the room. It all depends. You all have to be on fire and bursting with creativity on that day together. And that's the process. It's, it, there is a certain amount of kissing frogs, and you know sometimes it's not going to work. But don't get frustrated about that. It, you know, it's it's a it's it, to an extent it is a bit of a numbers game. And I say to some of my acts, look, you know, you you in making an album will possibly write up to a hundred songs, but there's nothing bad about that because you are working out what the best ones are along the way and what are the collaborations that work. And once the penny drops and you work out what the formula is that I need to work with that person for this and this person's a great lyricist and they, they pull my... Maybe I'm not the best lyricist and they pull my lyrics up a little bit. Then you 
you run with that and you go for the home run, but you have to try it out and to get to that point. But it is a leap, Nicholas, isn't it, often to be, you know, obviously you've been part of collaborative songwriting teams for 20 years, you mentioned, with Twin, and um, I'm sure you were part of other uh, songwriting collaborations. For someone who's never done it before, who's often, like, you know, the, the classic thing, writing in your bedroom, um, doing your own thing, pouring your heart out onto a sheet or whatever else it is, to go and then actually be in a room with other people can often seem like, a, it can seem pretty daunting. Yeah, I mean, it's weird. It's super weird. <laughs> You, you're going into a room with someone that you never met before and you're going to be relaxed, nice, fun and creative. Uh, and I mean, you always have the first 10, 15 minutes when you talk about the weather and oh, where do you live and all that stuff. But yeah, then, yeah. oh, do you have something? <laughs> yeah, it's just better, you know, sing, do something. And But I, I, mean, I totally agree with you. You just need to try and don't be afraid to fail. And we have actually in the beginning we did the sessions even we felt after two minutes this is going to be there's a waste of time this day because the, the the energy in this room is wrong when you've done it many times and it, it, this is also done with uh, to do with success when you are successful and you have a name you can actually also stop sessions in the middle of the day when you don't feel like it's gonna, not going to take us anywhere but I don't recommend that to do that too early because it's the failures you learn from. I have done, I don't know how many hundred sessions and songwriting camps. So I've been working with so many different people, but the only times I've got songs that I really got out on the market was with people that I had fun with. That okay. has been, I can like 100% fun is the word that, and, and that also comes with relaxation. I relax. I can be myself. I, I dare to expose myself with and sing out even if it sounds like crap when I do it. But it's like relax and fun. And then when you find those people, you're going to work with them again and again and again and again. Is that why a camp say may be a really good idea? Because you have more time to get to know the people, maybe have a night out after day one and maybe it's a bit tentative. Then you have a few drinks, you have dinner next day everybody's feeling a bit more loose and then suddenly the, the creative juices start flowing. Yeah, and camps are good in, 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 uh, in another perspective because you get a chance to meet a lot of new people at the same time okay. under a few days. So mm -hmm. camps are really good for, for networking. And, and camps is so important to say that f for songwriters that goes to a camp, I did it in the beginning. I thought that the quantity of songs I did at the camp was the most important thing. Fuck that. It has nothing to do with quantity. Network. Make sure that you find the right people. Don't even expect to write one hit song at the camp. Find the right people you like and work with them after the camp. That is what camps are for, in my opinion. Fair enough. Um, Brezzy, in terms of your own collaboration, I'm right in saying at the beginning with Blizzards, you would have been, you're the main songwriter in the band. Yeah, I mean, I should come back to one of the sessions years ago in London. I was sent to a session. It was in East Coast Studios and mm -hmm. uh, was sent in and quite nervous about it. and there was like two or three studios there and I walked in and I sat down with these two guys who I assumed were the people I was meant to go in with and I sat there I was there as a top liner essentially a top liner if you know is that person who writes the melody or the lyric and, and I sat there and they put a keyboard in front of me and I had no idea what they were doing and it was Letfield it was the iconic dance duo Letfield and I walked into the wrong room I was in the wrong bloody room and I was I was there as a programmer and they were kind of yeah we're looking for some you to develop up the beats I was like what the fuck I'm in the wrong <laughs> and there was a guy sitting in the other room who had written. He wasn't the guy who had written James Blunt, beautiful. So it was kind of, it was, I was kind of happy that I made the wrong call. But uh, yeah, from the, from the collaborative point of view, with I, I've, the hardest thing I've ever done is is when you, you know you think you think you know you think you know that you can do it all on your own. You can't it, because it becomes overwhelming. It becomes you can get very low. You can get very frustrated, very anxious. You can get all these different things if. If you're sitting there and you're, you're, you're hugging onto this song and you're saying, no one else can see this, no one else can... Because the hardest thing to do as a songwriter, if you've developed a song to a certain point, is to play it to somebody. Because if they don't respond the way you want them to respond, it's heartbreaking. And you can pretend... If you send an email to somebody and they don't get back to you straight away going, that's a great song, you're like, oh shit, it's a shit song. It's a shit. I knew it was a shit song. <laughs> and that's how we think as people. We catastrophize. We always think something is shit if, we, if someone doesn't immediately respond. So what I felt the hardest thing to do was, was to be able to just go, right, well, listen... 
at the end of the day, if people don't like it, they don't like it. But this idea of holding on to it and protecting it, it won't get you anywhere. And the, the best thing I ever learned ever as a musician, uh, and I'm not a producer. I th- one thing I've realized over the last couple of years, you have people calling themselves producers because they can write music. They're not. Producers, production's an art form. It's an absolute art form. Everyone can put music together, but a really great producer, it's an art form. And I, one thing I've made a decision in the last two years is to go concentrate on writing writing, craft a song, craft a song. Because when you get caught into production, you kind of worry about bloody drum beats, which mean nothing. They mean nothing. Drum beats are irrelevant. It's melody, 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 lyric, lyric. It's all, that's what people hold on to in a song. So if you spend half your time trying to make something sound good, you're, you're, you're competing against people who are far better than you at doing it, probably. But um, you, you, I find with writing, find what you're really good at. What's the one thing that drives you? And for me, it's lyric. I love lyric. I think lyric is every song starts with the tagline for me. And if you, one thing is an advice as a writer, if, you're a, if you could picture yourself playing at a music festival, middle of summer, place is packed, and everything stops, all the music stops, and all that's left is that tagline, and everybody's singing it, then you know you have a good song title. That's a good starting point. You know everything pulls out, and everyone sings that line. Or if you feel you could wear that on a T-shirt, that's a good tagline. If you've got a good tagline, You've got, a, you've got a really good starting point with a song. Please don't start a song with a drum beat. It's, you know, unless it's a dance track, you know, which is grand, but I think if you're like trying to sculpt a good song that's emotive and connects to people, don't start with a beat, because a beat, you know, they, people think... That would be counter to a lot of, a lot of <coughs> what people would consider certain song genres. Though. Certain genres would be beat, but I'm talking, if you're crafting a lyric, uh, I always feel a lyric will define the mood of the song. Yeah, but you, you're right. I mean, I've been in so many sessions where like four or five people in a room, you put on a track and you're just sitting there and you hear the track and, and someone's singing next to you and you're singing another melody and I'm trying to get singing a melody in my head. <laughs> I don't even hear what I'm thinking because you're singing too loud. And the hours, one hour go, two hours go, and we don't have nothing. And people are in the room are getting stressed. What, what is happening? I need to do something. And when someone says, oh, should we take lunch? Yeah, let's take lunch. I want to get out of this room because it's it, this most weird thing that can happen that you're th- sitting there forcing yourself to a beat mm. or like music that you don't have a melody and lyric yet. That's weird. Uh, so I agree. But some mm. genres and some songs, yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah, and some songs that I've, I, I've, I've written actually came out of a track mm. where we started. And, and, and yeah, it's weird because you look down to harmonies. You cannot change so mm. much. So you have what you have. Uh, but one recommendation I have, and it took, a few years before I learned that, never go in to a, a co-writing session without having backups. And yeah. have melody, have a lyric, have the tagline, have something. And even if you don't expose that you've prepared, okay. pretend that you if you come up it's with it. It came to you in the yeah. room, just here now. And you need it. it. You're going to need it, I'm telling <laughs> Perfectly you. Perfectly formed. Yeah, so be prepared <laughs> for session. That's the most important thing. We, we go one more. We say to our, our to our new writers, to our new talent, write a book of stuff. Yeah. Wow. Uh, have and take it to your sessions because your co-writers might want to root through it and go, oh, I really like that page. Let's work. Let's work with that. You know, it doesn't have to be a, you know, a novel, but just scribble your thoughts and your feelings, or you know, whatever you've said on your text message to your girlfriend or your boyfriend. You know, put that down. You know, because you might need it one day. I think it's funny. It's funny. Always be always be wary of songwriters who are in bands, because if they have something really good, they're not going to give it to you. They're okay. definitely not like Gary Barlow. You think Gary Barlow sits there and goes, "I'm going to give this song to Robbie." Well, he isn't his arse. He's going to keep it for himself. <laughs> so be wary of those. Be wary of writers who are actually commercially releasing music. Because if I wrote something that I thought was, "Oh, that's really hooky. I love that." I'm like, I'm like Beckham putting that on the table at a songwriting session to split it. But also, you write with, with coming in with the. You coming in with the idea, I think for me, I remember years ago, actually, st- when, when Hosier started, he came over to London, we, we had a production team over there, and he was so young, he was like 16 or 17, but I remember him singing, and I went, oh my God, you know, there's no doubt about it, you just know, this this is this is it, this is guy, this guy's going to be huge, and the great thing when happened, Hosier, from a songwriting perspective, and the thing that hasn't really been pushed, hasn't really been outlined, is the development that went into his songwriting. Uh, Caroline Downey, his manager, let him develop. She knew this guy had it. Absolutely, the minute I heard him, I went, that is worldwide, full stop. 
and he was developed because his writing wasn't strong enough when he was 16 or 17. He was nice, but good. There was so much more to come. He didn't know what he wanted to be. He wasn't sure what sound he wanted. And the next time I heard of him is when I heard Take, you know, Take Me to Church come on the radio. I was like, oh, it's just beautiful when that happens, when people are being let develop. But in an industry that was on its knees and is kind of getting back, development wasn't on the agenda anymore. If mm. you're not going to develop talent, forget about it. That's the only way to build a strong industry because you're just putting people out and they're, they're farting away and they're gone. They're disappearing. The careers mm. are over. Development builds you from every perspective, from songwriting to stagecraft to, to confidence. These are these things. And this is a, an amazing industry part of it. But Jesus Christ, it's tough. And, and throwing someone to the dogs too early is the worst thing you can do, especially from a songwriting perspective. Well, that in itself, Charlie, is... is a kind of collaboration, but that's what you do. You, you, you develop talent, find the right time for them to be released to the world. But I, I presume that resonates with you as well, that you just have to sometimes put the brakes on and allow people to develop their craft. Sometimes you don't know what someone can be. And you go, you know, the minute that um, one of my artists, Sigala, came in, yep. he w it, it was a songwriter that referred him to me, said, this guy's production sounds like he's from Sweden. He sounds he sounds so clinical in so his we production. Have a sound, you have you? a sound, oh, yeah, wow. yeah. He and and you sh you should. I met him on a writing camp, is what this songwriter said, and and you should you should definitely meet him. I think he's got something. So we met him, and and our whole model is is give people a chance. And we we said to him, come to the studios. Uh, we're going to give you a home. C come and use them as much as you want, um, but we're not going to sign a contract now. Um, we're going to just trust each other and hopefully something comes. Now, if someone had said to me at that point that he was going to be a breakout artist within 18 months, two years, I probably, and I, we all say this together, we probably would have said, no, get out, absolutely not. But we gave him that room, and we literally gave him a room um, to, to, to develop himself and, and work. And it wasn't until actually that he got to... Um, I think a bit of a low ebb that he he was trying every single day, putting his heart on his sleeve, trying to write the best songs, trying to go into into the room and get something out of it that that will work and, and start his career. Um, and he said, "That's it. I'm I'm giving up. I'm going to go and be an accountant." My parents are telling me do something that is a little bit more sensible with my life, and I can't take living off of noodles anymore. Um, and um, we said, it, it wasn't me that said it, it was my business partner who's a songwriter, and he said, you need to get your love back for music, so why don't you get a beer tonight and download an acapella and just mess around with it for the night and, and get your creative juices back. That was his first single, uh, which went on and sold millions of records. But you, you just don't know what it is that's going to connect or, or when it's going to connect, but you just have to keep on going and trying and putting yourself into the situations and, and, and remaining positive that if you've got the talent, it will eventually come. And we have this saying that you put the time in, you will get the time back. Nicholas, um, in terms of... Uh I'm going to come to Audley in the data part of that, but I'm going, to, I'm going to hold that off. That's like a tease for the audience. We're going to be talking data very shortly. It's going to get very sexy. Um, but in terms of... I'm always interested in practicalities of songwriting in terms of like the very simple thing of like putting stuff together and how many people should be in a room, for instance. For, like, is there an optimum number? Uh, there is... There is uh, an, uh, if we talk about rights... There is uh, an unspoken uh, rule that says a, a song should be written by three people and you share it equally, 33.33. .33. Okay. But uh, since I've been working with a partner whole my career, we have always been two. So my number has always been four. We are, we are four people in the room. Uh, sometimes that works out perfect, but I would still say that the times where we've been three, it's easier to control the situation. Four, it's like, again, someone sings there, another sings here. If you're four or more, everyone needs to know exactly what you're doing on the song. And then it can work with more people. But I don't think, don't aim for being many people in the room. Try to keep it, I, I prefer to have fewer people, actually. And, and when we were talking, I mean, we're talking about songwriting, and that is what we're in the room for. And uh, 
I mean, me and my partner between us, I would say that he is a better musician. He is a better songwriter than I am. But the combination between us is good because what I have better than him is another thing that's so important, and that's social skills. Because you need <laughs> to have social so skills. <laughs> because when the, when the vibe's going down, okay. you need to keep it up. Of course. And you need to make the people in the room feel good. That's what it's all about, fun. And put the clown hat on and just keep the vibe up. And that's why this, my strength has always been to keep the vibe up. And that has many times afterwards, is if, if you weren't in the room, this, we would have gone home because it's like, <laughs> so energy, this comes down to energy. It's so important with energy and positive energy because when you get the negative energy, it's over. Here's the thing that could kill the vibe, um, but I think it's important to ask, and, uh, and I think for this room it's important to know, is it, you talk about credits. How quickly do you have that conversation about crediting? And, and we'll say, like, when we write the hit song, how are we going to divide the royalty? Yeah, I mean, now I'm going to be hard to songwriters. I, I'm, okay, I'm going to be hard to myself. Songwriters are stupid when it <laughs> comes to that. Yeah. We treat rights and, yeah, if we talk about one single thing that we need to do, we need to agree on a split. Because a song that we just wrote is 100%. It's not less, it's not more, it's 100%. And if the four of us write a song, we need, sooner or later, decide how are we going to share 100%. Equal, maybe, or did we start from your track and your melody, you should have more? It's only us that can decide. I think, my personal opinion is that it's worse now than it's ever been before. Songwriters don't dare to talk about the split. Because it kills the creativity. Yes, but you don't have to bring it up in the middle of the session. Hey, can I get 60 here? No, <laughs> like, you what a brilliant talk. Yeah. 10 percent more for me. As songwriters <laughs> treat the split today, it's like if you work on a restaurant, you go there every day, you don't ask your boss how much salary you have and when you're going to get the money. You just go there every day. That's how songwriters key, uh, treat the split discussion. And that's why I created this system where we can talk about the split, but don't look in each other's eyes. We can use the app that we have in front of us all the time <laughs> and chat about it. So, but it doesn't matter if you do it that way. You need to do it. You don't need to do it at the same day at the session, not the day after, but in near time okay. when we remember, because we songwriters are so stupid, when we write a new song, we forgot about what happened yesterday. So we need to talk about it when we remember. The most of the time today, the split discussions are going on when the song is already out on the market and or just before release. And it can be three months after the session and it can be three years after the session. And if it's a hit, that's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. And then we don't even talk about it on our own. Our publisher and our lawyers are talking yeah, about yeah, it for yeah. us. And were they in the studio? No, no, they don't. So they ask us. And we don't talk about it either. So it's just based on expectations. I think I know what you think. And that makes a mess. And you guys should know, now you don't want to know, how many million euros that are circulating around in the industry that not can be paid out because we don't talk about splits. Easy. What uh, you get from left field? Field, uh, <laughs> Jesus Christ! I think the, that record tanked. Good. <laughs> Good shot. Um, yeah. What about splits? I mean, like, yeah, I'm interested to know how how you how you approach a pressing. Um, I'm not. Uh, I am quite transparent with them. That's the that's the biggest thing for me. I'm also when people say with splits, they go, oh, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter until it until the song's until big. Matters, if it's right. a big song, then you're like, oh no. And the problem is, you have to remember one thing. And everyone on this planet, no matter who you are, what you do. Every single one of us have an ego. We have. Some people's egos are unfortunately far bigger. Ego is part of the human psyche. And sometimes it's not even about money. It becomes about ego. And then that's when, it's, that's when you're in trouble. Because you start losing sense of everything when your ego takes over. So from my perspective, I'd be quite transparent with it. It's very important that, for example, we're developing an artist at the moment. And development is, for me, is where it's at. That's, that's, I love seeing someone going from... Literally, somebody comes into the studio going, what the fuck's this thing in front of me? I have to sing into to somebody who's going, I'm ready to go on stage. That's the best feeling, I think. It's as, it's as good as a feeling as going on stage yourself. Um, 
So development, finding someone you really believe in, finding someone you actually can visualize in two or three years' time doing it and making it. And the one thing with development is you're working with this artist, but they're not songwriters, but they could be in the room. And they might go, oh, I really like that. Does that make you a songwriter? I, I don't think so, in my opinion. I think someone, unless you're con contributing to the actual creative process mm -hmm. and saying this has... So you you got to watch that too. For me, in terms of splits... If there's two people in the room, um, and often in my case, I will come to a session with a relatively sculpted out song, and then it becomes about making it a hell of a lot better, and going, well, you know, you, maybe that can be better. And if somebody does something that's life-changing for me, then and there's two of us in the room, that's a f that would be a 50-50 split, even though okay. I came in with a pretty much finished mm -hmm. track. Um, but I think it's it, it's different for me, and I do think it's it's a conversation. It's it's as my mum said, it's more awkward than a fart in mass. Is having those conversations. It's a really awkward conversation. It destroys it, and you kind of go, it's going to affect. I'll put it over to my publisher. They can have that discussion, or I put it over to my lawyer, or whatever. And then it becomes a car crash. But with the blizzards, um, it was quite clear from songwriting that I was writing. And you have to remember one thing: like when you're in a band. The songs don't come out your, you know, they don't come out your arse. You have to put a lot of work into them. You an awful lot of work. You have to write them. You have to, you have to demo them. You have to get to the point. You have to go through them again and again and again. So sometimes you have to go. Yeah, well, I do deserve all that. <laughs> you know, I've put in a huge amount of work while you might have been going to the cinema and you enjoying yourself. So I, you know, the problem is when it's, when it's in a band and then the bands kind of go, hold on a sec here now. Uh, am I not getting? And I'm like, well, well, did you write the song? You see, you have to be very careful when there's five or six people. Especially when it's such a big revenue um, point for a lot of bands at the moment as well. It's the only real... Yeah, exactly. So you've got no. five people that are putting their lives on hold, and yeah, one person is writing the songs, but mm. those five people need income and need a reason to be part of the band. Absolutely, and I think that's where you have this... You have a very... In our case, I have grew up with these guys. We have a very strong personal mm. relationship, and I'm able to go, you know, this is... You know, if we if we make a good record, like we're in the process of making a third record, I never thought it would happen. We're making a record, and we're sitting here, and I said, "Here's how it works for me. We put we put the effort in to make a good th third record. The record does well, mm. or well enough. Then your touring revenue goes up. Mm. Uh, then you start playing bigger venues for better fees. Okay. And then you start perhaps pushing your merchandising. Then you start perhaps to look so." That work and that effort, you might be going, well, what am I getting here? I said, well, overall, if we, if we put the effort in together and we come in collectively, um, and if, for example, someone in the blizzards goes, I've written a song, and I'm like, oh, I really like that. That's your song. I had the scope that there is no ego with us. It's not like that. But I do, as a, as a songwriter for a band, I put an awful lot of my time into to writing that music. You know, a lot of time, and, and along with other jobs that I may have I, I, but I love it I love it I think it's, it's nothing better I think that is maybe one of the reasons people are nervous about collaboration though as well is because Charlie that it's very simple if you write a song yourself if you're a singer songwriter or you're doing your own thing you know y you don't have to have that conversation with anybody it's pretty straightforward you wrote the song it's your song I mean, you're kind of maybe sometimes have the benefit of being able to oversee a lot of this stuff if you're matchmaking do you have anything that you would advise people? Do you get stuck in? Do you think there's a moment I need to get involved now and I n actually need to advise the guys? I end up helping fight the splits all the time, um, which is, um, <laughs> I guess, it's <laughs> you, ha you end up with a writer coming, oh, well, post-event, um, oh, I definitely did more. That person didn't do anything. Well, did you talk about it on the day? No, didn't really feel that it was the right time or place. I thought thought that was your job, Charlie, um, and and that that is is it an issue? People say maybe maybe there should be split sheets in the session. That's that to me feels um, slightly slightly antiquated, and and it's very hard to say. Okay, well we're all sharing it. We're we're. 33, 33, 33, what happens if someone comes along and changes it in two weeks' time? What, what, what are they getting? What happens if someone isn't available to rewrite the chorus when the, uh, when the A&R says, oh, I'm not sure the chorus is, is quite right? And how do you split it then? It has to be an honest discussion between everyone in the first place to get to the end product of what, what is the splits. But I've had ones that have gone on for two years, I've had ones that have gone on for four years, uh, I have ones that still aren't resolved. Yeah, I remember um, I had actually, I was, uh, I was, we went over to LA to mix a second record and then I was, uh, the last night in LA I went out and 
went out, uh, knew I wouldn't be there for a long time, and um, I drank Guinness in LA, which is not a good call. And I got I drank quite a lot of Guinness, got quite sick. And the next morning, I was properly like, "This, no, I, I can't get in this flight. I couldn't stand up. I was vomiting everywhere. It's like proper hangover." And my producer, who produced the album, walks in to my hotel when I was at my literally worst possible, like wrapped around the toilet seat, shivering, going, I have to take a 12 hour flight. And he just turned to me and goes, by the way, that song that we, you know, that we did in the album, and it was the strongest song on the record. He goes, that's, you know, that's 50, 50. I was like, no, there's no <laughs> way. It's how does that? He goes, well, I changed a bit. Of I said, you produced it. You didn't write it. And I think people get confused between production and writing. Like I, he changed a bit of the structure in terms of like, you know, maybe put that there, but he didn't rewrite anything. And all of a sudden that transpired into him wanting 50% of this song when I was wrapped around the toilet seat uh, at my most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And I was probably, he's probably respecting me going, yeah, whatever, I don't care, I'm, I, I'm dying here. So, but I, I kind of had that conversation. I didn't understand that. And I said to him as a producer, why, why would you if, you, if you have points on the record, why, why, for example, as a producer who had a lot of experience, did you not say this to me when we pre-produced it? And I was in the pre-production process, which is very, very, very important mm -hmm. for an album. If you're ever making a record, pre-produce it. Do your demos. Have your demos. They're so, so important. Don't just walk into the studio to make a record. But when it was in that process that he was kind of just moving stuff around and doing what a good producer should do, but not a songwriter. And that translated into wanting 50% of the song. Did he and get 50%? No, he didn't get any of it. But it was he got points in it. But it was, it, it was an argument that his lawyer made to our lawyer. And then our relationship yeah. totally changed. Like, mm -hmm. I, I, I couldn't believe that. He, that was tried and I was a bit upset by it. And, and you know. I should not defend the producer, but w w I have been in this kind of situation mm. many yeah. times. Come on, and we need to define songwriting. Mm. If a melody and a lyric, if that is what we say, this is the song, I agree with that, but the production is so important for how the song's going to come out. And if there are major changes in the production that makes the song come out even better, mm. I, I don't have an answer for it, mm. but part of me says, yeah, that improves the song. Oh, so I would, I would the agree, producer yeah. should have... Uh, and I, I think in this particular credits. case, it was him kind of going, that is not strong enough. Go away and write another part. Mm. So I go away and write and I come back and he goes, now that's a good part. And I was going, you know, in, in the process, if he said, sit here with me and we'll write a better part, mm. now it's songwriting. But it was like, go away and come up with a better part. Yeah. And, thing, and, and it, you know, when I really looked at it, but it was really, and there was another uh, case of it in Ireland recently with a band that sung quite well. And I remember uh, the producer wanted songwriting royalties in it. And I said, well, have you got the demo? Can you play me the demo? And the demo is identical. The, the real track sounds much better, but it's identical, the demo. Yeah. And I was like, that, we have, I think that's where the confusion comes in, especially uh, songwriters who don't have a lot of experience. They might go, Fair enough. Yeah, no, you're dead right. There's fifty percent. There's fifty percent, yeah. and I think I I was close to doing that, but my manager, who was picking me up off the floor to get me on a twelve-hour flight, was going, "No, not happening. We'll talk about it tomorrow when he can talk." Um, <laughs> but it was really important that I did that because that particular song had quite quite heavy sinks in America, that ultimately served the band to be able to tour. We couldn't tour without the sinks that we were getting on these tracks because mm. you know we didn't make a lot of money as a band. We we really were just living week to week. So it was those moments, but we wouldn't have been able to do half those gigs if we gave away half that music. So it's, the, it's, it's those kind of knock-on effects by sacrificing points. So I do agree. I do think a, a producer who brings a lot to a trance song, it turns it into a, a, a different animal mm -hmm. that probably gets played on the radio. But I'm confused, and I could imagine you'd be confused. And I'm, I have a lot of experience, and I'm still confused. So we're not here saying we know... Mm. Everything I'll, you're talking about, you know, it's a confusing there's, industry. There's no handbook, is my, no, is really my thing. Like, I wish there was. We'd all refer to it, go, oh, well, they wrote yeah. two words, so that equals out to that. And th there is nothing. You have to decide it amongst yourselves. And, yeah. and you know, you have to use your better judgment to w what's the best outcome okay. and, and get to the conclusion, be that hopefully not via lawyers and managers and publishers and everything else, hopefully you can get to the point where you all decide it amongst yourselves so that it is freeway equal split and happy days. But what, what, what can upset me sometimes is the hunt of points in songs. I mean, a producer and a songwriter, okay, you can understand that relationship and both are working, f like working on the song. But I had situations where 
an artist comes in and says, I can do the song, but I want 25% of the song. Mm. F- yeah, if it's Beyonce, I know that, oh shit, that's going to bring my career like, <laughs> like that. Yeah, yeah. So is it worth it? If is it fair? No, it's not. But it can oh, actually. I'm giving Beyonce twenty. Yeah, me too. Yeah, no yeah. problem. Yeah. So, so, but I'll I give her yeah, I never work with Beyonce though. But I work with artists that are like nobody knows about, and they claim percentage in the songs. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, so what's the next step? The mixing engineer, the mastering mm. engineer. Yeah, Should yeah. the A and R have a point in the yeah. song because they did a good A and Ring? I have heard a lot of weird things, but but I also I said that recently. I um I I don't know. I think with Ed, the Imro report that was out, and I've read it, and it's really good stuff here. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm not talking. I'm not talking about maybe artists who've got a lot of experience and actually make, create a living from publishing and songwriting. And it's it's a very privileged and um, place to be when you could do that. A lot of people can't do that, um, but they're just as talented. They're just as good. They're just as good a writer. They've got just as good a potential, but they mightn't have got that look or that little. And I would, I would absolutely regard myself as very lucky because there's there's. I know many people who are unbelievable writers that we meet in that studio who aren't signed, who who mightn't have had cuts or, or stuff like that. Does that make them any less? No, it doesn't. And I think what we have to watch here in Ireland is that the person that creates, the creates that should be the person who gets the most out of it. It shouldn't be, like, and that, and unfortunately, that's not what's happening. And we got to look. We have to be honest. We can talk about splits and stuff. But we got to look at the the massive companies. Like how many times, for example, I've my band, or, or even from a writing perspective, where you get that call going, can you do a gig for us? We don't have a budget. I'm like, you do have a budget, but you don't... V- and it's not about music. It's, you don't value music, because you can get it for free. And it's ultimately the writer that suffers from that. And I think there's, there's a lot of people... If writers were given their fair due for what they did, and I've heard this argument, but you love, you, you love doing what you're doing, so you, you, know, you shouldn't worry about it. So it's a sort of footballers, but they get paid 100 grand a, a week. It, just because we love doing it doesn't mean we should, you know, there shouldn't be. And, you know, if you're a successful songwriter, there's a lot of, there's a lot of money in it. But if you're, you know, there's a lot of people out there who, who are just as good as those successful writers, but they're struggling to, as you said, to eat noodles every week. And how do you create an industry that helps them and grows them and maybe gets them into the place where Beyonce walks into the room and they can tell her, tell her to piss off at her 25%? <laughs> um, which would be lovely. Yeah, I'd love to be able to do that. Wouldn't <laughs> just you know, feck off. Imagine telling Beyonce to feck off. Yeah. Be. Um, we actually had someone here last week that has written with Beyonce in, in Carla Marie Williams, and um, she spoke about uh, a track that Beyonce sung called "Running," which Naughty Boy produced, <coughs> and um, pretty much that's her song. Like, uh, you know, she didn't explicitly say it last week, but you could tell like she sung the hook, she sung the lyric. I, it's her baby, you know. She brought it to Naughty Boy. He brought it to another level. He actually added a lot in terms of production. She went to... She dreamed all her life Beyonce was going to pick up one of her songs and then suddenly, without her seemingly making any effort, um, because of an A&R man's decision and he got slighted and snubbed and he played it for Beyonce's A&R and he goes, wow, I'm having that for Beyonce and nobody's going to argue back here. And then suddenly she's in America in a room with Beyonce who's singing her song and they're collaborating, Okay. So for me, like that is obviously Carla Marie is she served her Jews, she's been in Xenomania, she's written songs for um, you know, Girls Aloud and um Alicia Dixon and, and she she has earned her Jews to be in that room with Beyonce. But for a lot of people, practically right now, it's that thing of like, how can I get into the room with other people that are going to have impact on my career? Maybe I can't be in Xenomania. Maybe I can come and write in your studio. You know, I mean, if I'm a songwriter that wants to get ahead. I mean, what are your guys' advice in terms of, like, getting into that room, getting out of your bedroom and into the room with other people who can impact Charlie? Create the room yourself. That's Um. what we did. Um, And uh, you don't have to chase... I want to work with this person, I want to work with this person. You will eventually end up working with that person, but create your own squad, your own team, your own your own people that you love working with. Go through that process of trying to find out who they are. Do your own songwriting camps. It doesn't it doesn't take all of the resource in the world to do that if you all want to do it. Um, and and those are great places, you know, get get your friend to invite their friend to get some to get someone new over from another country and and all get together and and before you know it you've got something that everybody else is looking at going hmm that's interesting well, i think i'll have a bit of that 
And that's my, my advice, is create Have the room. Have you done that? Practically, tell me about how you maybe... Give me an example of how you would have done that in, in Talyard. We did it straight away. It was the first thing that we did. Um, we, we had, probably at the point that you, you came over, we had 10 studios at that point, And we said, oh, 10 studios, that's great. Well, we can have a writing camp. We've always wanted to have a writing camp. And we just started the management and the publishing company. And we thought, what a great way to get people involved in what Talyard is, get as many songwriters that we know bring over people that we know from Sweden, people that we know over from Denmark, people from Ireland, bring in some people from, from France, as many places a, around Europe that we could potentially bring people in from and put them all together with a couple of our new talents that we just signed. And we, we were working out of unused offices that are about to be converted into studios, a couple of the studios that we had, and, um, and and shelves of studios, and that that was the first writing camp that we did. Um, not a lot came out of that writing camp, um, apart from the connections, which is the most important thing we talk about. No song that you could go, that was the one. Our second writing camp, um, one of our most successful songs came out of that, which was Kai Goes Stole a Show, well, our most successful song as a publisher. Um, and that was song that was as wasn't the song that was written on the day in the writing camp. It was of an artist that we brought over from South Carolina. We heard his voice and we went, he's great. We should get him over we should get him over. Um and they wrote it and it was recorded on the phone and then it was produced after the session and then it became a massive song. But it was thirty minutes at the end of the writing camp that, that song was written. So when I say like it create the room it can come from anywhere. Yeah. It won't be how you expect it to be. You can't write the rule book, write it yourself. Charlie, I'm nosy, so tell me to mind my own business, but do you actually, do you pay for their flights to come over and put them up and all that kind of stuff? Or do you say, here's a great opportunity? A bit of both. Sometimes we'll go, y you, you, you don't have a publisher, so we're going to pay for your flights and we're going to pay for your accommodation and we think that you're great. Use the facilities um and, and and do what you're best at take the pressure of the money out of it but if if they're published by sony atv or <laughs> or bmg then of fair course enough, we want it coming enough. from their paycheck yeah of course yeah. um so um i think it's just you know whichever way is best but we we our whole point of being a company is to break the rules try and find somebody new try and develop them try and get them their break try and try and make things happen don't be the majors that's us um, Nicholas, I want to talk about data because in, in what Brezzy was saying earlier on there just a minute ago, that, that thing of like the creator should be the person with the lion's share, but oftentimes, you, well, you said it yourself, songwriters are stupid um, and maybe don't take enough care. Mm -hmm. So with Audley, um, I mean, data for a lot of people that are creative, it's, it's almost like, I don't really want to deal with that, let somebody else deal with that, mm -hmm. and then it's maybe, maybe it's too late. So... I am interested to know exactly how practically like that oddly could help people manage the data, manage the credit, manage even the share, like in, and, and figuring it out, like even as you said, post the session. So if we go into this now, we, we first we need to realize what we're gonna talk about is super complicated because now we, we leave the creative part of the music industry. Now mm. we're talking mm -hmm. about the back office, the the, the the system that makes sure or should make sure that we get paid when the music is used. Uh, and that is complicated and I would s I know a lot and uh, there are a few others in the music industry worldwide that knows a lot uh, but the majority of the people that are working in the music industry on publishing and label don't know how it works so therefore it's a challenge for the industry because the knowledge is generally really low how it works you kn the people that works on a label know the label side of it publishers knows the publisher sides of it and so on but it's a combination between all the different parties that is the key here first to understand why it's so important we need to just talk about how much new content that's coming out on the market it's over 30,000 songs a week on Spotify each minute we're sitting in this room listen now each minute 400 hours of content is uploaded to YouTube it's not only music though, it's the whole, uh, but 400 hours a minute. And it's music in many videos. And how should we do to control this? 
and the answer is data because the machines can actually handle the, the, the tracking. So it comes down to what we call identifiers. We need to identify everything all the way from a songwriter. If we start with a songwriter, if I, if I say IPN, can all the songwriters that knows what that means raise, raise up their hands? Wow. Jesus, yeah. the entire class just failed yeah. the exam. So IPN, as a songwriter, not knowing your IPN number and don't know what it is, is like going to the bank trying to get cash without your social security number. It is your social security number as a songwriter. And you need to have that because the spelling and the text of writing your name is not going to work. If any of your publishers and managers or Imro want to write my full name, they cannot even write it because I have letters in my name that they don't even find on their keyboards. Yeah. So how are we going to cope without the codes? And there are four codes that we are talking about. IPN is the first. Uh, so, and it stands for interested parties information. What the boring name of a code, but that's the real truth. What it stands for, and it means every songwriter and every publisher has an IPN. You get an IPN as a songwriter when you become a member at Imro or another PRO. Then you get your 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 IPN number. And it's so important that when you write with other people you need to let them know your full name and your IPN number so they can tell their publisher. Because the, f the IPN number and your legal name together with the title of the song generates the next code and it's called ISWC, International Standard Work Code. And now it gets a bit complicated. And ISWC is an identifier for the composition. Mm. It has no sound to it whatsoever. Mm. It's information about who wrote it and what's the name of the song. If we have the split, we add the split, but it's not mandatory in the beginning to get the identifier. And why it's so important to get this ISWC early is because we change. The format of the song changes. We add an artist, we change the, the lyric, uh, we change the title, we change a lot of things. <coughs> and if there's more than one writer with different publisher and different society, then they're going to start doing the changes out in the, in, in the black hole without knowing that it's the same composition we're talking about. So a, composi a, a song that you write, if we call that a composition, should have one and only one ISWC. Uh, since I'm a partner in my company, I'm partner with Max Martin, which I'm really proud of. He wrote one song called Me Hit Me Baby One More Time, and he wrote it 100% himself, and he has one publisher. In the existing world today, it's more than 54 ISWC codes for that song, with weird names, weird spellings, and, and so, but he was 100% alone on that song. And here is why it's so important to assign this code early in the process. Um, why is he got why is there 54 codes? Because there was no early identifier. The ISWC was not assigned early. So a lot of publishers in the world got hold of the information about the song. Sub publishers out in the world. And when they don't see a code, they request a code. Okay. So suddenly publisher all, all over the whole world start requesting codes <laughs> from the from the societies, and therefore we get multiple codes. And and now it's still, okay, it's a problem, but the real problem comes to the next code, and it's called ISRC, International Standard Recording Code. And that is the unique identifier for each recording based on the composition. So if we take Hit Me Baby One More Time, it's a composition based on a title and Max Martin's name and 100%. But now the recording from the studio gets an ISRC. And now this, and, and then the fourth code is called IPN, International Performer Number, and that is for something called neighboring rights, because in some territories in the world, you get paid as a performer, as a guitar player, a producer, a singer, an artist, you get paid when it's publicly performed, and that is called neighboring rights. And that IPN number controls your, your rights to get paid for that. So IPI needs to be linked to an ISWC. 
the ISWC needs to be linked to the ISRC and to the ISRC we need to link the IPN so we know who's playing on the recording. These four codes, if they were matched in the way I just explained, we would have much less problems in the music industry. The problem is that the codes are assigned too late in the process and there's no link between the codes. And to try to explain when it gets really messy, Spotify, as a consumer, you press play on a song, you see a title and you see an artist, but in the back end of Spotify system, they are not playing the title and the artist, they are playing an ISRC, an identifier of that unique recording. And they play millions and millions and millions of ISRCs each month. And this is different from territory to territory now, so now I'm going to give you Swedish figures. So in the end of the month, they take the most played ISRC they had they, the month all the way down to 5,000 uh, streams. Everything under 5,000 streams, they don't count. I must reserve if they've changed this number, but that was the last I heard. 5,000 is... So if you're under 5,000 streams, you don't get paid. Cool. Yeah. And now they report to publishers and to PROs, performing rights organizations like IMRO. They report, we played these ISRC codes. But if IMRO gets the ISRC code but have no idea which is ISWCs they are linked to, because IMRO works with you as a songwriter, you as IPIs, and your ISWCs, they don't know the link to the ISRC. So therefore, we need to start matching text because it, the Spotify also send the text fields with the name of the song and the artist. And that means that each text needs to be exactly the same on the IMRO side to be able to match. And here, a lot of things goes wrong. So we cannot identify the song that was, the recording that was played on Spotify to your composition. So, and even if we have a link, or if we should guess a link, because the machines get smarter and smarter, so after a while, the machines can start guess that, well, this ISRC should be linked to this ISWC. But then, if the, the composition you have have 34 or 54 ISWCs, to which one should we link the ISRC? And we have a complete mess. So therefore, the solution is to assign the codes earlier, but I would say that that is something that you as songwriters and creators, you should not even care about it because that is up to others. Oddly, my tool is one of them. Together with the publishers and uh, the, the, the PROs, we are working on assigning codes earlier. The only thing you need to do is to keep track of who did what, where and when in the session and try to remember it some way. My tool offers a perfect way for you to do it on your phone, since you're on the phone all the time. Instead of, and I say that we have features that helps you in your session. We have lyric tools and stuff. So if you want to use it during the session, do it. But if you just want to use the rights part, it takes you 15 seconds after each session to just put in who did what, where and when. We keep track of the IPI number for you. Today we do it with, uh, with PRS, STEAM, and ASCAP, but we are talking to your organization about maybe introducing what we call the IPI verification. And that means if you're using Audly, the app, we verify you on the IPI number, and from that moment on, you never ever have to care about it again, because we make sure that the IPI number is sent out to everyone you're working with. So we want to lower thresholds for creators to, s to think less of data, just do what you need to do, that the thing that you are the only ones that knows the truth from the studio. If you add that, the rest will go automatically. Why this is going to be so important is the massive amounts of new material that comes out, and it goes quick. And today, in, in the existing music industry, if we say that we have four different parts, we have those who create the music, we have those who handle the rights, we have those who distribute, and we have the consumers. My vision is, I mean, this is the existing music industry, and it is extremely complicated when all this information from you 
that had fun in the studio, it should pass through the system out to a consumer that pays for listening to your song, and then the money should travel all the way back, and it maybe finds your pocket. And it's super expensive for you as a songwriter, the administration costs for all the middlemen that are involved in, in this. My opinion is, uh, or my personal view, if when we sit here in five years, seven, maybe ten years, we will have a total different landscape in the middleman sector. I think that songwriters will be more self-published. Uh, artist producer will be more, uh, they will own their own masters. We will still use the companies, publishers, and, and, and we say labels. I mean, I, I, I think labels will be called music marketing companies because yeah. that's what they are so good at. They market the music. So I think you own your own master, license it to or buy the marketing service. But what I'm saying here that you as creators are taking more responsibility and ownership of the original rights, then it's even more on your shoulders to make sure that you keep keeping the, all the information right from the beginning. Because if you don't have people that help you track it, it's going to be bad. Can I ask you a question? Is there anything else like oddly out there? There are a few, uh, but no solution that has come so far as we have done with the integration with the codes, because we are working with the IMROs around the world and, and to do the hardcore, boring data code mm -hmm. integration. The things that are the keys for you. I mean, you can never, you can never have music as a music creation as a profession if you don't have this part of the industry but we are the, the system that has come we're in the forefront when it comes to the integration and, and code assignment there are others but they are more focused on on uh, features for making songwriting process easier song pitching and that kind of stuff but if there are people in the room that are emerald members this is an app that will be useful straight away for them when they download yeah it is. Uh, we have been doing it for four years, so I would say that we're pretty early, uh, but we are taking huge steps forward now, and uh, Universal Music Publishing is the first major publishing that joined us, and uh, we, uh, I mean, our goal is, is to be a music industry standard for creator metadata collection, because, and, and the challenge for us is that we, we cannot be two because then it's going to be problems again. Yeah. Where, where is the truth? <laughs> so we unify need to be the belts, basically. Yeah. Is what so you need to and do. That, therefore, we, we, we try to hurry up and, and, and be first. So, and it's, uh, we have, it's a shame that we don't have uh, the Android app yet, but it's going to be out a, any week now. But don't worry about no, that. No, but iOS, just download it. They or made a bad choice. Yeah, but we have, we have the, the web application, of course, and it's free for creators. We don't charge you anything it we don't ask for your credit card just download it it's free so try it out and um, and uh, we can talk about the business model later because i get that question all the time but in the today today we have the publishers are paying for it uh, but if we are going to take a music industry standard position then we need to find of course sustainable uh, business models but then it's up to the industry to to pay for it and Last, when we're talking about this, one thing that I can, that I think is going to be an incentive for you guys as creators about this. If we do the boring work with the boring data, we're going to have another a beautiful outcome, and that is credits. Because if we know all this information for legal purposes, we can give this information also to the streaming services so they can, they can push out in their service who played what, who played the bass, because we know for registration purposes, but then we also can push this information. We know which studio it was recorded in, so we can push that as well. So we have created something that we call Song Story, and Song Story, to me, I, you know, the first thing I did when I bought a CD, I took out the booklet, but we don't talk about albums anymore, and we don't talk about booklets, so I named it uh, Song Story. So my vision here, if we collect all, th all this information for legal purposes and for, for, um, for credits, we pack this in, in a really nice way and with ideas I have that we maybe can use the camera on the phone and take unique content, pictures and videos during the creation process that we never had access to before. 
and we let that go together with the music out on the streaming mm. services. So when the consumers out in the world are listening to your song, they can press the song story tab and get it complete behind new, complete uh, a new type of behind the scenes experience of the creation of the music. And you as cre and creators can get much more attention than you get today. No, it sounds really good. And I wanted to give you a fair run of that because I think there's so much practical and useful stuff there for all uh, songwriters and producers in the room. So, yeah, thank you, Nicholas, um, for that. It's we're lucky to have someone like you to explain that because it's it can it could have been boring, but yeah. we're lucky to have you, who's a fun guy, to um, yeah. to give thank us you. Words, yeah. <laughs> no, I'll definitely be downloading. It. Um, look at to be honest with you, uh, we scratch the surface. Always feel the same way. There's just so much to discuss in terms of collaboration, songwriting, recording, credits, royalty splits, um, song camps, and you know, I suppose creating your own room, which I think is a really nice idea, and I think something that a lot of people can take away from the day amongst all the other stuff. Um, I want to say a massive thanks to our, th our three, our panelists here today, to, um, to Charlie, to Nicholas, and to, to Brezzy. So give them a big round of applause. <laughs> I'm going to stop talking. Because I want you guys to ask questions now. I know there's always going to be in, in something like this questions. So if you have a question, will you stick up your hand and we'll try and get around as many as we can? Are you putting up your hand? You are. Yeah. Brilliant, yeah. Uh, like, um, I was wondering, like, once you, like, I've got a hit song that I've written, uh, as I explained, a couple of other people, the ones that we won't play ourselves. How do you go about, like, getting those songs to people to listen? Uh, um, the issue you have is... From a publishing point of view, say the publishing companies like Sony ATV and, and Universal Publishing, they will tend, a lot of them will tend to go towards bands, commercial bands who've released stuff and it's doing quite well. It's an easy target for them because they know there's at least, if, unless you're a, a writer who might have a cut in a record, then, the, then they become interested. But it, it is a difficult thing. If you're in a band, my advice is to, is to grow the band. That's what will get you a publishing deal. But I, I, I haven't heard many times where publishers will... Like, for example, um, I worked very hard to get my first publishing deal, but it was, it was awful. It was an awful experience because it was with Universal Publishing, but the guy who signed me left two days after he signed me and left me scratching my arse with a publisher who didn't sign me, who didn't want me. Uh, and left me there, owned my, owned my songs, essentially owned a part of my songs, but weren't, wasn't shopping them. And I spent four years trying to get out of that contract because it, so it was such hampering for me. It was not a, good pro not a good thing. And I was very wounded by that. And I spent another four years, five years, thinking to myself, is it even a good idea to have this? And then over only recently signed another publishing deal. Uh, but the process of getting there... You know, for me, the idea of publishers, the going directly to a publisher, going, we have these songs, we give them to something, they won't. It's well, the way to do it is how can you build something that makes them interested in you? How can you build something that potentially got synced? Go to independent sync companies, people who get stuff on TV. For me, TV is a brilliant avenue. Uh, in Ireland, we even have amazing, like, to, be, to give them their credit, RT, some a lot of the music, they work hard to put Irish music out on, on some of the Irish shows and shows that are on. And that's your first calling card. Create some calling cards. Create some. Create a story or a template. But walking into a publisher, going, I have, you know, unless there's something truly, you believe there's something truly special there, and you get an A and R guy that that listens to it and go, we have a song here. But I I do think create your own story. Really, it doesn't have to be a band. It could be a really clever viral thing. It could be something. And I mean, even Joe do a lot of Joe Dari with Paddy works with do a lot of sports with Irish talents. You know. One thing I do know labels look at and publishers look at, and it, it's, it's almost, I was in a, a thing last week, a music-y, bullshit -y thing in, in London, and a lot, I, I'll give you an example. A lot of them were looking to sign an act that they hadn't heard, but they knew the other person wanted to sign them. And it becomes, it becomes an ego thing, and they go, well, they had these many hits on their YouTube. And they're like, who cares? Have you heard the music? No. That's some of their th thought processes. They're, they're, signing, they're signing kind of buzz stuff, but they're not signing people. They're going, to go, that's a... That's a it's an artist I can develop, I can work with. Create a story. What can you do? Is there something you can do? And make them interested. And when you do walk into the room, you go, well, this is what we did. Walking in dry, it's hard. I, I've done it. And I, I was, it wasn't massively successful. And the only time we got publishing was when, like even the first album, The Blizzards, we were laughed at by publishers. Uh, it was the second when we got a, a, a sync in America. And that sync was got by an independent sync company, not by a publisher, 
by an Irish person who said, I really like that song. It'll suit this song. I know a guy in the same company in America. And then all of a sudden, I get a publishing deal. And it was purely because of that. And it was because of an independent person who liked the song. Uh, so don't always put your eggs in the pu ma major publishers or major record labels. There's, there's friends and allies everywhere. And in this country, I do think there's something going on in the industry. There's a good people here. Um, we can bitch and give out about lots of things, but people will always try to look after their own. They'll always try to get it. RT has said, I have to give them their credit. They get a lot of, sh they get a lot of shit. But I know that some of the same people, they actually actively try to, to push Irish music. You look at any of the sporting events, it's always an Irish song. And, but it has to be a good song. You can't push songs. Well, it's it's often yeah. cheaper though to yeah. use an Irish song. It is. Well, we don't get pa you don't get paid from RT. Like, so well, that's it. Yeah. If you if you if you don't have a publishing deal, then you may get the, the press and PR. Paid. You know what yeah. I mean? Like yeah. you you'll get the attention. Like I mean, that's why often you'll see uh, TV mont sports montages soundtrack by an Irish band. And in fairness, it's a gr it is a great shop window. It's so it's it really is. It is helpful from that, that, that POV. Okay, one thing it also does is important. Don't underestimate the importance of confidence as a writer. Yeah. You get a bit of confidence. I mean, maybe I'm not shite. Maybe I am. Maybe I have something here. Because that is one of the templates mm -hmm. to a writer is we often put ourselves down and don't think we're good enough. We have that, that kind of imposter syndrome where we, mm. we just don't think we have it. And that's a natural way to be. It's a natural human thing to be like. And it's, it's okay to be that way. But when you get that little, little spark, that good story, it helps you. And it helps you as a writer. It motivates you. you, know? and you but still, I understand story. your question because I think... I think w w I've been working as a songwriter is the same as you. I d I'm not an artist. I don't perform. I write. I've, I've been writing songs. And um, when I was active as a songwriter, it, it was the same situation then, but it's even, it's more like that now. If you want to get a, a song on an established artist, get the artist in the room. That's what all writers say. You need to write with the artist in the room. And how do you do if you don't have that contact? Kidnap. Yeah, <laughs> that's how you do it. No, but so there, you need to open your mind. Don't focus just on one way. Mm. I mean, publishers, we need them. Yeah, but don't trust others so much. Be open-minded. See what can you do with your music. If you stay in the studio, just writing songs, waiting for Rihanna to knock on the door, it's not going to happen. So. I was so frustrated with me and my partner. We were so frustrated uh, somewhere like mid our career. You know, it didn't go so well. We had the music out, but it didn't happen. We never got in the studio with artists and like, oh, why is it so complicated? And then instead of just complaining, I said, oh, let's do something about it. Where can we find other ways of getting our music out? I stumbled over a Norwegian guy that was doing a project together with a toy company in the US called MGA. They were doing a, co a clone of, of Barbie doll, but it was called Bratz, the Bratz doll. Mm. And this guy told me like, oh, Bratz, they just come in cowboy Bratz and gymnastic Bratz. They don't have any music connection to Bratz. Should we do something and propose it to them? And I'm like, a big American toy company? Yeah, w why not? Let's do it. So we proposed an idea of making a rock band out of the dolls. And we called it rock, uh, the Rock Angels, Brass Rock Angels. MG, uh, the company, uh, MG, loved it. They were totally over it. So we got the job to produce an album for the, for the dolls. <laughs> and we casted the voices. We wrote mostly all of the songs. We recorded and produced everything. And uh, it was, they did a DVD out of it and also a CD. But that was normal, you know, CD didn't sell so well. But then they suggested in the actual doll box, they put like, you know, the small CD, what we call like the, I don't know, it's the small version, not the full size, with one song on it. So each doll had one song and they put it in each doll box. And we negotiated a royalty for each because it was a sell. 25 million boxes they sold. So, f <laughs> what? Just by stumbling over a Norwegian guy. So be open-minded. Oh, don't crazy. think that, don't think that getting your song out on Rihanna's album or Beyonce or whatever it is, th the traditional way is the only way. By doing that, I got money to, to work with music for a very long time, and it put me in a good position because I was open-minded. So. Don't just think that is one way. Think 
wide. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you had to tell it. Uh. <laughs> you set me a track. I have it here. I just know how to feckin' use that. Well, how d- I don't know how to feckin'. What the feck is that thing? <laughs> See the, the other end. Oh, shit. Sorry. I'm not, there you go. That's, that says, says I should know this. Oh, there we go. There, there you there. go. That's USB. So we're going uh, how d- are we going to get that into a doll? <laughs> so it's quite... It's quite uh, I find songwriting quite hard sometimes. You get very stressed doing it. Like you, The one thing I'll say, one of the main things from a songwriting perspective, some days it's not there. It's just not there, and that's when collaboration really works. Because it might be there with the feckers sitting beside you, and then it's like a spark plug, and then you're gone, and then it becomes. But there's days it's just not there, and don't beat, beat, don't beat yourself up about it. Like it's not. There's days if you're an athlete, you, you, it's days you play shit. You know, there's it. That's the way it is. But with songwriting, the great thing about collaboration is, if it's two or three. It'll always be one fecker with <laughs> something there that can start it and move it and and get it going and stuff like that. So I think that's where collaboration for me is. Is 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 that if that's the art? This is what we're talking about here. Don't be afraid to it. Let go of it. Let go of your song. Don't be so protective of it. And most people are quite sound, though. And w- I'm going to say one more, just inspiring thing. I'm going to c- try to keep it short. But I love what you said by creating your own room. Yeah. Uh, a, s- a Swedish, uh, a new Swedish act. Uh, uh, they've been around for a year now. Uh, is is mainly a producer uh, that has been producing music for a s- famous Swedish artist. But everything he did outside that collaboration Victor. would... Huh? Victor. No? Yeah. Oh, okay. It is Victor. So uh, everything that he did outside that collaboration with that artist, he never got any attention on, on his song. So he got so tired. So started his own band, brought in a vocalist that sang a song. Own publishing, own master, own everything. Uh, in this massive, massive... Uh, <coughs> digital world with releases every every day so okay it's a good first step but how do you do now to reach out playlists spotify get on the playlists but how do you get on playlist go to spotify so he went to spotify knocked on the door talked to the people that actually are creating this the the playlist they put his songs on the playlists boom he had five million streams and now universal signs him that's also a way of doing it. Like, there's so many ways, but you need to. I know it, this expression is. I hate it, but think outside the box. That's mm, mm. that's you need to mm. do that. And I know it's hard. And you think how oh, how I'm gonna find that outside the box, but suddenly it's gonna come to do you. you. Do you think it's right in that perspective? I suppose that Spotify is becoming the animal now. It's becoming the the beast that can break a career and in, in a good way, in a positive way. And it's, sometimes I always get worried about that because is it. How is the process of picking those playlists? Like you look at the BBC One radio playlist, which which breaks bands or doesn't break them, it could often come down to one arsehole who's just on the day goes, oh, I'm not feeling it, and then all of a sudden, that power is is quite. It can be quite dangerous. As some, like, there's, it, is is there that process? Do you think within Spotify where there's there's probably a board of people going yes, 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 and no, and I think is is the power in there are, they are and, and they're mainly. From radio stations that yeah. were, um, but ex ex yeah. radio employees. Yes. Is that yeah, okay. um, but if think about radio, one playlist. You're fighting for mm. twenty spots on that playlist. True. Spotify, hundreds of playlists for different mood styles, mm. all with different cur- different curators who are looking for new music to put on those playlists. So there's more of a lane. You can start on one playlist and it work on that playlist, which then gets you five more playlists, which then then okay. the five lead to 10, lead to hundreds. If it, if it works and it connects, they know. Yeah, know. And it starts to translate, and that was, that was the story. I think he's on probably a billion streams now, isn't he? And, uh, and owns the master and owns the publishing, and you can, you can do the sums, so that's... Who is, who is that? It's... Yeah, the ba- ba- the name of the band is Naked, and his name is Victor. Sexual. Uh, uh, sen- uh, uh, sexual, yeah. Best song of last year, uh, I thought. Okay, yeah. um, that sounds interesting. So Spotify, you can be your own artist. You can you be your own. You artist. can you could create your own artist project with the songs that you were talking about, and it not be you. Yeah, um, and own the master and give it a go. Just knock on the door. Probably. It's the um, David. Yeah, I think it's kind of thing you're on about 
Spotify yeah. recording studios. Okay. So th there's a new thing we see, and uh, w I think the first time I saw this concept was actually through YouTube, and they have something called YouTube Space. Uh, YouTube Space uh, is if you have a channel, a YouTube channel, and you have more than 10,000 followers, you get access to use YouTube Space. Uh, there are five YouTube spaces on uh, New York, Los Angeles, uh, Berlin, I think Paris, uh, and they have, uh, they are building more, I, I, but you can check it out where it is. So it means that you get access to the most top quality equipment to do videos, recording studios, and you can use it for free. It doesn't cost you anything. And you leave the place with, that, with the ownership of what you just produced. They don't claim any rights. Spotify has done th uh, the same amazing things. So they are building studios around the world. They have one in New York and now they're building an amazing one in, in the new office in Stockholm. I've, I was there a couple of weeks ago and it's I've seen many studios but this one is something else like super cool. And that studio will be available for artists, producers to use for free. The, the waiting list will be long. The, uh, <laughs> last time in New York, I heard that Sting was there, Ed Sheeran had recorded there, but it's amazing. They just give you the opportunity to come to this amazing studio and record your music. You leave the building owning your own master and it doesn't cost you anything. So that's pretty nice. Thing. It's I think probably Sheeran right. Sting could pay for their own fucking studios. Yeah. yeah. Like, geez, why don't you give it to the acts trying to? Yeah. Break yeah and Spotify yeah. should be given back as well. Yeah. I mean, look, at it's for another day. This gentleman here. Well, first and foremost, I absolutely disagree with that model. Uh, at the very foremost, that no record label. And I understand why record labels have developed the 360 model. Uh, they have to figure out a way. But you're saying they've become a marketing company. That's essentially what they are. A songwriting, somebody who writes a song, for me, record companies are not publishers. It's an art form. Publishing is an art form. It's not record. Like it's, We have to separate what they are. Um, and... I've seen this, I've seen this in action and it's heartbreaking to watch it. I don't think it works at all and I think it can create an awful lot of tension within bands. And I've seen bands also, uh, very successful bands, who despise each other. Despise each other, won't even sit in a room with each other. And I find that heartbreaking because the best part for me being in a band is I love the people I'm in a band with and grew up with them. I would do anything for them. I couldn't imagine that ever happening. <coughs> but that's because we've never made a lot of money, so there's never been that, <laughs> that tension. And I could imagine that's what happens. But I, I, th from my, my perspective on publishing, when, when, when Universal Publishing offered the deal, I remember being in the room and it was quite awkward. They said, who writes the lyrics and the melody? And I went, I do. And they went, right, everyone else leave. And I went, oh, God. Like, I felt like the room, I wanted the room to swallow me up. And they went, that's, you know, you, you, you're signing the deal here. It's, we want you as a creative writer. And that's how it was put. They said, we're not signing the band, we're signing you. And I was, I found that uncomfortable. Because I felt I was betraying the band. That's what it felt like. And I wasn't able to deal with it. And I struggled with it. And I said to my, our manager, and I said to, I was very open with the band. I said, I, I'm not comfortable with this, but obviously I put a lot of work in and I, I am writing the songs and there is contribution. So there is a royalty split with the band. Uh, there always has been and there always will be. Um, but I find that model and I find sometimes when record labels come in and they sign acts, they forget that that band, and now we have to differentiate also between a band and somebody who might be a singer-songwriter. That band's built upon like long friendships. relationships, real friendships, real stern, oak-bound friendships in many bands where they care a lot for each other. And, and some labels don't give a shit about that. 
and they'll come in and they can disintegrate and destroy it. And I remember saying to the lads, ne we'll never let that happen to us. <coughs> and to be fair to us, we didn't. But unfortunately, I've seen many bands destroyed from it. And it is that transparency thing. It's actually sitting down with the lads every couple of, once the song's written, we're writing another album at the moment and I've been in a situation where I've come in with a half written song and I've said to the lads leaving, you were a big part of this now, this is a split. And because we've always been honest with each other, it's, 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 it's been amazing. But then when I, I signed publishing last week, they came home and he goes, what's, so what's the story with publishing? How is, you know, how is it going to affect us? And I said, well, with this particular deal, I was signed as a writer to write for other people, to develop artists, but it will massively benefit the band because my publisher's best interest is to push my music. And if the Blizzards are releasing new music, they're going to be pushing that music a lot. They're going to be looking for syncs for that music. They're going to be doing that, which will really benefit the band, which once again will benefit our touring, all these types of things. But for me, the most important thing with a band and publishing and is, is your values. What are your values? As an individual, what's your value? And as a band, what's your values? And the top, my individual value is loyalty. I, if there's any decision to be made that crosses that, I don't make that decision. And honestly, and we're very honest and we're very, very loyal to each other. So if a publisher came in and said, you know what, or a label, we want you publishing and push the lads out of the room like that again, I'd walk away from them. I wouldn't tolerate it because um, when I'm 90 years of age and I'm, I'm signing out of this world, that's the shit I'll remember. I won't remember some label, you know, pretending they could sell my music. That's more important to me than that. And I think that's why we're probably still together. Okay. Um, going to keep going, get as many questions in as possible. Down the back. Good question. Mm. So how can we become like the similar hubs? The hub, the kind of hub that Brezzy's talking about, mate? I think I think it's it I, I actually worked in Ireland in two thousand and seven when, when the labels started retreating and it started becoming really London centric and people going and the same thing was happening I think at the same time people going, Oh, do we do we need the Swedish office even more? Actually maybe we'll merge all of Scandinavia into one. Um and that that sort of uh, to me disrupted things a little bit here. You have to bridge the gap. You have to go. You have to travel. You have to you have to go and put yourself in those places. You have to go and absorb things like a sponge and then bring it back here. Um, you know, go and if you've got a creative hub here in in Dublin, go to London and tell everyone about it. You know, bring people back here. You know, everybody, every writer, every creative, every producer in the world needs a new place to go to and a creative holiday. Play on that. There he is. <laughs> and w what we've done in Sweden, there is many now, I think it's almost up to 10, but especially one songwriter and, mu and music uh, producer uh, education. It's oh called yes. The Music Makers, uh, if I explain it, uh, translate it into English. Uh, it's so smart. It's a university, a two-year university uh, course and what's so unique, that's 20 students in each class. And there's in the school, there's 20 studios. So each student has their own studio. And the music industry is part of this, uh, yeah. uh, this, uh, this course. So publishers are coming every week and tell the students what kind of songs they are looking for. Two weeks later, the publishers comes back and they listen to all the songs together with the class mm. and give them feedback. So it's government sponsored, isn't it? Is, is that the Kinda case? Yeah, it's government sponsored. Could you imagine our lads doing that? I like know, that? It's, it's, so it's unbelievable. It's government sponsored. I think and I remember Red Triangle telling us about yeah, this. And I'm in the yeah. board of this school, so I, I'm talking warmly about this school, though, but there are a few others as well. But from this specific uh, school that, uh, that I'm in the board for, I would say that of all the new, really talented music creators and artists in Sweden, 80% of them come ha has been to this school. The, yeah. the guy we were talking about is one of them. And they're everywhere. The and now the quality. And we have one time a year, we in the board, we listen to the applications for the, the students that want to come in. And a couple of years ago, we, you know, we maybe had like 
30, 40, 50, now it's hundreds of applications because the people know that that school, if I go there, it's going to bring me value. I'm going to be better. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. <laughs> you can actually apply. You don't have to be Swedish. You can apply That's for really it. That's really interesting. Yeah. But the, the, the idea is, why isn't that here? Like the idea is, if you, I give you one of the reasons I think. I think pop's the dirty word in Ireland. It's a word that we, we don't understand. We go, oh, I hate pop music. I was like, no, you don't. No one hates pop music. Yeah. You know, everyone, that's, there's something in pop music. You know, some of it is pr pretty sterile, but most pop music's amazing. You know, yeah. my mum always says, never trust anyone who doesn't like ABBA and doesn't like, um, what's the other thing she said? I didn't remember. <laughs> but like, and then people, ABBA are shit. I said, have you actually listened to ABBA? They're unbelievable. Like, that's songwriting as uh, ultimate. But I do think pop is seeing as a word here. It was like, if someone calls you a pop band, they're like, oh, Jesus. Like, like I always refer to us as a pop band. You know, that's what we are. We write songs that we want to commercially put on the radio that people enjoy listening to. But I think from a pop production, it's an art form. Don't belittle it. Don't kind of go, ah, it's pop. It's really hard. It's really hard to be really good. And it's really hard to be ahead. Because that's what happens now. There's a lot of producers that are putting out that Afro-Caribbean sound thing. It's gone. It disappeared. Like it, it was big for a year. It's gone now. And people are still putting that out. And I, I think... One thing we have to weigh on here is we have brilliant writers in Ireland and we have a great story to tell. We have, we have brilliant storytellers. But I do think something like that would be amazing. Or I think BIM are doing some great stuff and I think there is people doing great stuff, but it tends to be lads who want to be rock stars who, you know, I think the pop thing is, I don't get it, the pop production. It's, it's, a, it's a different world and I love, I love watching them in action. And I think the Swedish nailed it. They, whatever they've done, and what I love about Sweden when it comes to pop music and, and Scandinavia in general, their lyrics are simple because it's their second language. And they don't, you know, when we write a lyric here as a pop lyric, we always question it. We go, oh, that's a bit cheesy. Where the Swedes are like, oh, it works, it's good, it's hooky, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter, don't, don't overthink it. And what was it? It was that KLF, the pan book on how to write the perfect pop song. That very thing you cannot believe you're doing is the very thing you should be doing. That's your hook. That thing you're going, oh, God, that's that's too cheesy I'm like no no that's it so I think they're, they're the things pop isn't a dirty word I mean we need to grow that industry I think that's what Camden is is kind of that's where my heart is in is in pop music I love it no it's it's absolutely something that the Swedish model is a really interesting one to see and for such a creative race the idea the government would actually s invest money in that which would return money probably far more in the long haul uh, it seems like a really interesting idea um, there's, there's three people with their hands up I'm going to try and get to you all but Starting at the very back with this chap here. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, we are adding a lot of features. Um, the Android is a shame, and I, I blame it on the tech people. And uh, that's uh, We should have had the Android for a long time ago, but of some problems. But it is on its way. Uh, we are working more on audio handling, playlists, so you can use audio for song pitching as well. You can make a uh, playlist that you can share with others, since the system is closed only for the people that are invited to the this, this, this song. Now you're going to be able to share playlists and also see if the, the person you sent it to have been listening and you're going to have uh, communication. So that is things that we're doing for, for creators. Uh, and then we are doing many things uh, with PROs and, and publishers and labels. That's going to be more uh, on the back office side of it, but there's many things going on. But if you have ideas of what you want, let us know. If you're using, or you're using the iPhone, the, the app, so when you're in the app, Try to just shake the phone, and menu pops up, and you can easily write in ideas and, and suggestions. Yeah. So we what? Uh, how do you use the app? Can I ask you? So you're you're collaborating with um, remotely. What I, w one thing, I shouldn't say this because there's cameras that records this. So, but uh, what we want to do, we want to lower thresholds for creators to use it. We know app is good because everyone has a phone in their hand. But we are in negotiations with DAW manufacturers to get it in the programs that you are using on a daily basis. So 
when you have a certain, <laughs> I shouldn't say that now, but if when you have one of the programs in the settings, you log into your audio account in the actual software. And then you get all the features on the channels. So you can do it at the same time as you're producing the music. Wow. Yeah. You can both be working on the same project in different locations. Yeah. At the same time. Yeah. You, the data is collected. Every, it doesn't matter where you are. So, and I didn't say which one it was. I, so, but that's <laughs> sick. <laughs> Gentlemen. Um, what do you think of uh, WordPress, which is more just a long caption uh, for plain stuff, basically? Taxi is more about syncing with things and syncing. Yeah, Taxi, and there's one called Disco as well, I think. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I must, for me personally, I, I know uh, too little of them, but I'm sure that how we distribute music. Uh, if I mean today, we as you said, Spotify with Spotify, and we have YouTube and Apple and a few others. But I'm convinced, 100 percent, I think it's I know we have what we have right now, but distribution formats would change. It has changed forever, from cassette to CD, MP3, download, now streaming. I don't think that we will lose the digital format streaming, that we will go back physical. But how we get the music out? Now we call it Spotify, but synchronizations like uh, like taxi and uh, what they are doing maybe that's the new ways of, of listening to music it's all about giving a license to someone yeah. to, to use the music yeah. and who knows next time you open the bottle of beer you hear the music when you open the bottle anything can happen you know and but it's all about licenses and that's what those companies <laughs> companies are working with uh. and i think we will mm. see an experience Ocean of companies <laughs> that works with these kind of li licenses. Nicholas, be honest, when you lift the toilet seat in your gaff, it plays music, yeah. doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. I know that's a fact, isn't and it? And you can choose which song you want. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I'm trying to think fast what would yeah, be that which song. Which song would it be? Uh, I was doing the same. Well, why does Always Rain On Me by Travis was the first <laughs> one that <laughs> came to it, mind. Yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> this lady. Um, don't sign any contracts. Yeah. Um, my best advice, I have, I have one act who very young signed uh, a record deal, a publishing deal, oh, and, a, uh, yeah. and a production deal, um, and was ill-advised by, by management at the time uh, who signed the management deal with them as to what all of those things were, and actually the manager owned everything. Um, so n never sign anything without uh, a lawyer. Uh, there's plenty of good music lawyers here. Um, it depends if it's an Irish contract or an English contract or, or, or where what, what country it's governed by, but always seek advice. Never sign anything without advice. And on a creative level, be open to everything is my advice. You, uh, you should absorb everything like a sponge. Um, you know, be open to co-writing, be open to, you know, because you will learn that way. I always say if, uh, if uh, an artist or painter wanted to um, become the best painter, they learn from lots of other painters. So, um, so be open creatively and never, ever sign anything by it from anyone without seeking advice. I think from that perspective, the most important person, full stop, is your manager. A good manager that you implicitly trust that you absolutely believe in. And a manager's job isn't to manage you, it's strategy. It's you to walk in and go, well, when I'm 20, that's what I want. And then every decision he or she makes is to get you to that place. And it might be a decision that annoys you at the time, but it might. But that's the strategy that you pick. So the situations where I've been like, oh, I, won't, I should do that, that's brilliant. Go, no, that's not part of the strategy. It won't get you to where you want to get. It might get you a, ba you know, a slap in the back where people think, you know, you're delighted with yourself, but it's not going where you want to go. But the big thing I'll say from a creative point of view and from my own perspective, uh, I'm quite open about it. Um, when when I left, when I moved to London and the, the blizzards kind of took a break and I did the solo stuff, w the way that happened, and I've never really forgave myself creatively for it, I was writing for other people at the time and I, I had an arse in my trousers. I had no money at this point and I had, there was nothing, genuinely I had nothing. I was making, trying to make music in my bedroom. 
and I, I wrote this song and that was all right. I said, we'll pitch it and I pitched it to publishers and, and a label and the label went, we love it, but we want you to sing it. And I was like, no, I don't want to sing it. It's not me at all. It's not my type of music. It's not really what I'm into. No, no, you have to sing it. And I, I had to, cause I had no money and I had to get some kind of deal so I could make the music. So I did. And that song was called Can't Stay Young Forever. That wasn't me. It wasn't the music I wanted to do, but I kind of, I ended up forcing myself into a corner and having to, to make a record, I had to try and get a, a deal and I got a deal with it and ended up making a record I wasn't happy with. Did well. It was a good pop record, but I wasn't happy with it. It wasn't the music I wanted to make and I've never forgave myself for that. Why was it? Well, why? Just, just stylistically, wasn't me. lyric? What was yeah, it? Yeah, just, it was just, it was a situation where I was kind of in a situation where I was, I was in trouble here like, and mm. I was, I needed to figure out how to get some finance mm. to, to survive and to live and to, to make the album. But ultimately, if I went back to that period, I, I should have moved home. And I shouldn't have done that because I put that out. You know, I, I'm proud of it because I made the record and stuff like that. But it's it. You, that's once again where I sacrificed my values. So I could make something so I could survive. And it's not a bad thing I did or anything. It's not a bad thing. But I find it hard creatively to to say to myself, that was one thing I swore I'd never do. Mm -hmm. uh, but I suppose through desperation, to be honest, at that point, I had to do it. What I would suggest to you from a creative point of view, write down your values. I mean that what is it that you want to create? Why do you want to create it? Who do you want to connect with? And whatever comes your way, no matter how good you think it is, your decisions are based on those values and never sacrifice them for anybody or anything. Mm. And when you're 56 years of age, you'll be happy. You'll be proud that you've, you've, you've made the right moves. And I'm not in any way overly regretful of what I did, but I, it was something that I, I'm not particularly, it's not something I would have done if I went back again. I that's really good advice. My mammy. Oh, yeah, that's, that's really good um, from both guys. Nicholas, do you want to do you want to add anything in there? Are you happy? Uh, well you said, I mean, you said that don't sign anything, and but and I agree with that. But you also said get a manager, and I think manager good can manager. be good. But how do you find the right manager? Yeah, and if you're 16, even if it sounds you don't want to hear this, but if you have parent, use your parents to protect you in the beginning because. I as being a young artist, you want things to happen and you want things to happen fast mm. and people will promise you everything. Oh, we're going to do this fast for you. Oh, this is going to happen tomorrow. And you sign and it's over. So you need help from people you trust to check everything. Yeah. And when you check it, check it again. And if the, the person that calls himself or uh, she calls them as himself a manager, if they really want to work with you, they need to be prepared to work with you without getting your signature on the paper they want. That's what I recommend you. That's three brilliant pieces of advice. Yeah, for I think that's actually a really good place to leave it. Uh, advice mm -hmm. to your 16 year old self. Thanks for that, Tia. Appreciate it. Um, so, yeah, that was a brilliant evening. I really enjoyed it. So much learning as ever. But again, to should the we talk more about music rides now? And <laughs> 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 that's going to be in late night Imro sessions. Um, next time around, we, we definitely will. As ever, there's stuff that we. We will have to come back to cover again. But for now, I just want to say a massive thanks to the three boys, to Charlie, to Nicholas, and to Brezzi. Thank you very much. Thank you. And to you guys, see you again soon. Have a nice evening. <laughs>